I'm Meta Spencer, and today I have a real treat, uh, especially for those of you who are interested in the Middle East and know a thing or two, as I simply don't. I'm, I'm certainly interested, but I'm totally confused about all the dynamics of interactions among all of these groups of people who don't seem to like each other much. So I have two Iranians here with me, both of them professors and friends of mine. And uh, one of them is someone I had an opportunity to interview about three years ago when she had just been released from prison in Iran. Um, and uh, she is uh, Professor Homa Hudfar, who is uh, pro an emeritus professor of uh, anthropology at the University of the Concordia, or maybe you just say Concordia University in uh, Montreal. Uh, so it's lovely to see you again, Homa. Yeah, and and then we will have another conversation, picking up where we left off a, three years ago, with my friend Mohammed Tavakoli Tarki. What? Greetings. Greetings. Hi. Good to see you again. Look at this background. He he's explained to me that these were wine uh, bottle storage units. And he's converted them to use as a bookcase. Isn't that extraordinary? Every time I turn on the television, I hear that there's another bloodbath of some kind going on. Apparently, there have been, in the last few weeks, um, uprisings. In fact, in several countries around the world, especially in the Middle East. And uh, I guess the government is cracking down very hard because, as I've heard of it, uh, the number of deaths is uh, much higher than it was during the Green Revolution, what, about 10 years ago? When would that have taken place, Mohammed? Uh, 2009. Well, so explain everything to me. Uh, Homa, I, I, I want you to start us off because uh, I hear that you have ongoing contacts with people there. I didn't dare, by the way, uh, ask uh, anyone in Tehran to be a guest on this program because, as Mohammed explained to me and didn't need to, uh, it uh, it would be a bit risky for, for anybody there. So I don't want to put anybody in jeopardy. But maybe you have contacts that you can discreetly share things uh, that they have told you about. Well, actually, I don't have that much contact. Nowadays, it's a little bit difficult for people to have direct contact with me because even though I'm released, uh, I'm still an ex-prisoner. So I do have some contact, but not as much as I had earlier on. But the news is coming out. And of course, there has been uh, an uprising and um, demonstrations against the, initially against the increase of um, petrol prices. In other words, just removing of the subsidies, but that which put the prices up more than three times, that usually means that it will everything else will go up accordingly. So this time, the difference between although Iran has been observed having this kind of protest uh, demonstrations also two years ago, but this time was very specifically amongst the lower income people or normally constituency of the regime. Um, regime claims to represent them. Uh, but, but of course, no. And it was quite widespread is, is in many cities and villages and places. So, um, and um, the crackdown was very, um, very severe. It, it is obviously, it was obvious from the development that the regime was already ready for it. And therefore, they very, from very early on, from the first hours, they started shooting people and killing, I guess, with the hope that that would frighten people and send them back home. Um, maybe uh, Muhammad can add more to it, but this, and then they cut the, the internet. It was a little bit difficult to get direct, um, um, direct uh, information, but information is coming out now. Little by little, um, we still don't know how many people have been killed. Certainly, was in uh, at least documented there's more than 240, but 
many uh, assumed that it was um, much higher, maybe up to a thousand people. Because some of the people who have been, we still they haven't announced the number, and some people whom I know that's directly from people I know that have been shot dead in this process, and the family had to sign that they had a heart attack. Otherwise, they wouldn't get permit permission to bury their dead. So that those kind of things are happening. Wait a minute, hold on. You can't bury a dead person. Why? Well, because for, in Iran, you need permission for everything, not just for publishing a book or writing an article, but you need a permission to, to bury your dead. That's and, absurd. That's ridiculous. What are they supposed to do? Leave them out on the street? Well, they wouldn't allow them to bury them in, in, in their proper places. But anyway, so they had to sign that they had a heart attack and then they were permitted and then they did they couldn't really have a big big uh, funeral they had to be it had to be very quiet so these are these this is first hand information <laughs> Lord. but um but um the regime itself has announced some maybe seven thousand people have been arrested they haven't announced the complete list of where they are because it's very widespread in many different cities and, and small towns and villages. So they say we haven't yet been able to gather all the information, um, which is which is just an excuse not to give the information. But so the arrests have been quite rather widespread, um, and amongst RSDs, apparently there are people, um, teenagers and young children as well. So. Well, let me, I'm very, I'm very curious about what's behind it, uh, because, you know, I always think of an uprising as representing a demand for a change of regime or something of that kind, or an ideological um, manifestation. Um, but if you're just talking about the price of gasoline, is it gasoline that they're ob ob objecting to? Yes. yes, it was uh, a response, uh, um, the uprising that started in the middle of uh, November was a response to a withdrawal of subsidy to gasoline and increase the price for people who have been going through this uh, really uh, uh, difficult economic situation. And the immediate response was, uh, you know, uh, uh, protests, demonstrations all over the country. And uh, to, to understand it, it's really, it would be interesting to compare it with other social movements and uprisings in Iran. Often Iranian demonstrators have been and uh, opposing the regime in any kind of form. They have been nonviolent. This is the first time that you see an uprising taking a clear violent turn. The, uh, it, sorry, the protesters themselves began. Well, protesters, because the kind of looting that happened, it was unprecedented. And during the Iranian revolution, for example, some tar places were targeted that were closely identified by the sh with the Shah and the regime. And uh, this time, it seemed like, like there was a looting that is happening that could be a sign of really severe economic conditions in Iran. That is, people are increasingly becoming poorer and poorer, and the economic resources that they have are not sufficient to, um, you know, make it. And and thus the the attack against sites and looting that has happened. At least these are the kind of things that we have seen. Uh, could, one could understand it as sort of severe economic pressure, and of course this comes in the context of. Uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions, variety of economic sanctions that are imposed on Iran and under the situation of a um, sanctioned regime, you have monopolies emerging that are very closely associated with the regime and they are becoming richer and richer. On the other hand, a smaller, more middle class companies and groups wither away because they cannot compete, they cannot find ways of breaking the sanction, whereas 
the larger companies with the state support can break sanctions and get around it. Uh, and thus you see, uh, the, and, and, and this is the really intense source of a lot of the conflicts is that uh, at the same time that a, a particular group closely associated with the regime is getting richer and richer, the majority of people are becoming poorer and poorer. And this has become a, a really the, the great grievance that people have at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, economic grievances normally would baffle me unless they're really, people are really desperate. But I, now when you mention this sanction business, that throws a different light on it. Now, I have friends in Russia who are also suffering, but probably not nearly as much as the Iranians, uh, from uh, sanctions. You know, r r the Western countries are sanctioning Russia because of the Crimea situation. But it seems to me my Russian friends are simply resenting the U.S. and uh, attributing the blame to them rather than uh, 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 criticizing Putin. Now, but now, is that similar to what the attitude is in Iran? Are the people there who are complaining about their desperate economic situation blaming their own rulers, or are they blaming the outsiders who are imposing these sanctions that may be the real cause of the uh, economic distress? Is it clear? <laughs> or, or are they unified? Maybe some groups are looking at things one way and some groups another. Well, I, I think there is um, what is going on in Iran is both. Of course, people are blaming Americans for the for the sanctions, because also many, at least amongst people, I was talking before I go to prison was that this was against the human right. You can't encourage a global economy and then come and put sanction on basic. Um, goods and ba basic trade. I mean, this, is, this has been something, in fact, it was a complete, uh, a lot of mobilization around that in the late 90s for the huge um, sanction that was against Iraq. But then this has, because of the 9-11, things were kind of forgotten, but I think it's coming back. So Iranian do blame the American, but at the same time do blame the regime their own uh, the regime, the Iranian regime, because of their inability to deal and understand global economy, to understand um, the, in, uh, global politics. So they kind of, they feel they are left in between the two, an Iranian regime and American imperialist regime. So um, that is uh, happening. And But I also wanted to um, go back to what um, Mohammed was saying. I mean, there was sure there was some riot this time. There were looting, uh, looting that was happening. But it's also a regime strategy. Sometimes when they use, they want to use extreme uh, violence to justify it. They actually send, and we had seen videos of very organized group that come with a motorcycle and instrument, and they start looting and bashing people and people car, and so then. Okay. Justify the violence that is this they, government sending these motorcycle people? Well, <coughs> or are you talking about the looters themselves and the protesters? Themselves? Well, they, probably both are happening. But while I think when people are also suffering, they look at the banks or some of the other places. Yes, the destruction does happen. But also, there's a systematic strategy with security officers who also. Um, do it themselves to justify the killing and the shooting that they are doing. So it's a, it's a, it's not it's a provocateur. Is that the idea that yeah. they're pretending yeah. to it's be it's more of that than it's very systematic. It's not the first time they have done it. They have done it in 2009. They did it in, in 20, uh, December 2016 and uh, January 2017. But Definitely this time, it was very systematic. They were very ready, and they did come in to do it. Because otherwise, how could you justify immediately when the demonstration starts shooting live? Uh, this, this makes a lot of sense in a sense that uh, there has been genuine 
economic grievances and adding the, the price of uh, gasoline, which is fundamental to uh, organization of life in uh, urban, urban Iran, when the price goes up there, the price of everything else goes up. And in a sense, it was very sort of, I was very puzzled that why did the state decide at this period of intense economic pressure on everyday Iranians, increase the price of oil? I mean, in a sense, it doesn't, it doesn't make, make much sense. Well, do they, but, do they have to? Is there any reason they don't have a ample oil? I mean, after all, it's an oil country. Yes, it has, uh, it has a lot of oil, but it's uh, because of the uh, economic pressure, because of the sanctions uh, under a lot of financial pressures. And thus, the grievance translates into demonstration, and that's um, very normal. And as Homa noted, it's possible that the state has participated as and had its own agent provocators to, to attack in order to legitimate harsh response by the security forces of the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. Can uh, you but, sell their oil, by the way? Is there any, uh, is there any problem with their uh, getting, getting uh, money for the oil that they have by exporting it? Well, the economic sanctions that the United States has imposed, the banking sanctions, makes it almost impossible for Iran to uh, legally uh, transact with other states. In a sense, uh, 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 United States has been um, weaponizing the economic interdependence as a way of sort of bringing intense political pressure on Iran to force it into negotiating. And, and regardless of whether one likes the Islamic Republic or not, and whether it's a supporter of it or not, what is very clear is that the approach that Donald Trump has pursued, it's not, it's not paying dividend. It's creating a lot of chaos in Iran, it's creating economic chaos, political chaos, but is not going to uh, sort of uh, transform Iranians into uh, lovers of United States? No, but will they knuckle under? Will they, will the government eventually say, okay, we'll do what you say because we can't afford to hold out? In the long run, we are all dead. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I suppose the other part, though, is if they, can, if they have trouble selling their oil because they can't export it and get the money, then wouldn't that be a very good thing to give to, you know, cheapen it, you know, practically give it away to the people as a way of keeping them uh, loyal? Uh, why would this be the right time to raise the price of oil if they can't even get rid of it on the world market? I really don't understand the economic rationing for increasing the price of oil at this time in Iran. Mm. Maybe Omar does. Well, no, the, firstly, we have to look at it. IMF has been asking Iran to remove the subsidies from, from oil for a long time. See, the oil we take out of um, the ground is not oil that they can use. So the really the um, processed oil, um, Iran doesn't have the capacity to do a lot of that. Secondly, it's not that they can cheapen the price of oil to sell it into the public because, the, well, as Mohammed says, it's a banking issue. No bank can deal with Iran. But it's not only that anyone, any country, any institution or organ industry that buys oil from Iran then becomes subject to the sanction. Comparing the, the market for Iran, uh, a market, you know, and I said, no, no big company would be willing to buy oil from Iran if they are losing, they're going to lose the market of getting access to the United States market. So what, what um, Mohammed was saying that, in, in fact, United States, on the one hand, through organizations like World Bank, IMF, is encouraging to have a global economy or everyone produces what they are best at and then buy what they need from the market, but at the same time then uses, weaponizes the global economy to its advantage. It's a new form of imperialism and is not lost on people, especially 
in the Middle East where people watch what happened to Iraq and then now what is happening to Iran, which is even more severe than what was happening um, to Iraqis for 10 years. It really, uh, this kind of sanction is not just economic problem, but it gradually it turns into, you know, destroying the fabric, the cultural fabric of a society. So that's what, what is the issue. The other thing that often people don't realize, in the context where you don't have democracy, people can't go just vote. The, like the, what we always talk is in some countries, people vote with their hands, go and put a ballot in the box. And in other countries, people have to vote with their feet. They have to go in the street in large numbers in order for, for the uh, regime to take uh, notice of them. I have watched this in Egypt several times when I was living there. Then I watched, we watched it in Iran, and we are watching it now in the rest of the Middle East, Lebanon, Algeria, Sudan. <laughs> and so this is going, going on. This is true that so partly we watch this violence because people want democracy and we don't have democracy. So those, those are the makes the situation complicated in the context of Iran. Also, people came out for the price of oil, but then the demands, because the unhappiness with the situation is so much that the demand soon uh, changed, the slogan changed, and included many more things. And they want the regime change, they want democracy, they want many other issues. But it, it is sparked by increasing their oil prices, which politically, it is actually, um, was the, I cannot understand, like Muhammad, the sense, because they, if they didn't want this uprising, they should have known. I mean, unless they deliberately, there's some kind of a calculation that they were waiting for this, um, that they wanted to be an uprising and then suppress it and, mm. and move on forward. Especially since we have the election next month. I, I, I didn't know you had elections coming up. These are the powerful election, I mean, big, the main part of the government is uh, is going to be elected, or are these just peripheral? Uh... No, these are a presidential elections, and presidential election usually also happens with local elections. So in, in, in Iran, we have the two elections together. I also have to say what is interesting in the case of Iran is that although it's not a democracy, in the last 40 years, Iran has had more election than any other country on earth. The last time when I was looking, which was two years ago. So Iran has the infrastructure for democracy, a representative, a representative democracy, but it's just that then they choose, they disqualify people whom they don't like. The condition to be a candidate is that the regime accepts you. Um, so basically, we have a show of democracy yeah. and the infrastructure for it, mm -hmm. but not the actual, not the substantive, substantive democracy. Well, we can have a whole conversation about the shortcomings of democracy, which are becoming extremely obvious to me, someone who's been the most devoted Democrat in the world. But my God, we just had the election in Britain, which is going to bring Brexit because of a, a real public opinion. We just had having the impeachment in the U.S., and uh, certainly that's not going terribly well. Uh, well, well uh, let me just note something that um, the Iranian, uh, the last presidential election in Iran took place in 2017, that brought, that moved out Ahmadinejad and brought to power Rouhani, who was more uh, liberal and was uh, a, a promoter of uh, international coexistence and, and uh, negotiating with the, with the United States. And in a sense, the Iranians had their Trump age ending in 2017. Uh -huh. and, and it was at the same time that uh, uh, the, in the US, you, um, Donald Trump was elected and went against the nuclear agreement that Iran had uh, signed with uh, support of uh, international organizations with the UN. And in a sense, this has, Donald Trump has also put a lot of pressure on 
on people who are promoting international dialogue, international collaboration, international coexistence, and has actually strengthened the most right-wing elements within, the, you know, within Iran. So in a sense, the policies of Donald Trump has not promoted liberalization and democratization of Iran, but the reverse of it. Well, that's why when, uh, uh, when Homer said a bit ago that the people want democracy, uh, uh, my real question at that moment in my own mind was, do they really, do they still want democracy, despite the fact that when they had Rouhani, uh, he wasn't able to uh, get much cooperation from the rest of the world. Have they turned against him? Are they, are they uh, well, you say they're blaming the current regime, but I don't know what that means. Uh, but there has been attempt to uh, equivalent of impeachment or censoring uh, President Rouhani. So there has been the right wingers in Iran have been organizing intensely against him, and and they are also intensely organizing have been organizing against the the nuclear deal and say that Iran should never sign a nuclear mm -hmm. agreement like Rouhani. Okay. Well, then would that be an argument for Homa's view that maybe they really want, the regime really wanted this uprising so they could crush it or? Uh, uh, well, I don't, I don't know whether there is a unified regime in Iran. So uh, the, the Iranian president is on one side and the supreme leader is on the other side and they often don't see eye to eye. And, uh, and Iran is highly, uh, has a highly fractured kind of political institution that has really kept it alive. So speaking of a regime as a singular regime and, and a single voice, yes, often the Supreme Leader speaks in the name of Iran, but there are also other political tendencies, political organizations or, or uh, ideological orientations within the regime. Right. Um, uh, I like to hear uh, Homa's understanding because it's much deeper and localized in Iran with her experience. No, I don't think so. What, what I, um, I think I agree that there is no, no regime is like singular. But all the regime in the world have different factions. But in this case, I especially when I was mentioning, I said, the security officers, the Revolutionary Guard organized, Revolutionary Guard is part of the regime, but is not the whole regime. So Revolutionary Guard organizes all these. I don't think necessarily they check it with the Supreme Leader that, shall we send someone to demolish uh, people's property so that we can shoot? But they did have, in this case, because the shooting started so early, like it wasn't like they were trying to contain the demonstration for one day or at least until the afternoon of that day, the, the shooting started right away in the very morning that it happened. So that means they, they were expecting it, they were ready, and that it also happened, the shooting didn't just happen in Tehran or just the, in the major cities, it happened even in the smaller cities. So that means they did have the order to shoot. Um, from early on, pr probably from before people came to the street. But that to me says that most probably this was organized, of course, and planned. But of course, you know, when things are planned on one side, it never goes exactly according to what they want. You know, there are lots of unintended consequences in, in, this, in this occasion. But also I want to say that, yes, Rouhani have been put under pressure, uh, and but in many occasions he tends to then support the regime rather than support the public. And so in some way, presently, if you read all the sites and all this, people fe feel they are betrayed because although he's not going to be, um, he's not going to be re-elected anyway, he, he has finished his eight years, he could have stood on the side of people, but he didn't. And that was also partly people, many people now think about not participating in the election. And one of this, at least one thread of argument is that if 
fewer people participate in election, the chances that Ahmadinejad, which is the ex-president, be re-elected since they don't have many other, other options to put forward. But Ahmadinejad, the chances that Ahmadinejad or people like him be elected will be much more if the public doesn't participate in large number. Because when people participate in large number, they tend to vote for someone whom they feel is a little bit more democratic, like Rouhani versus Racy last time. Like they choose not the people who are part of the extreme regime. Or but, Supreme Leader supports it. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it is in a way, um, politics in Iran is quite complicated. We have two, two system of elected body of the elected government and non-elected regime. <laughs> so, and and as, as Homer noted, the regime has been promoting itself at, at, a, at a certain level as a promoter of the oppressed and dispossessed. And what we see now is in these demonstrations, the very people that the regime identified with and had, the key, so, uh, had them as their key supporters are now turning against the regime. And this could also explain why, uh, why the response to it was so immediate and, and uh, without any hesitation, they went to crush the, the uprising because it's coming from the most oppressed, the poorest part of the population that have been historically supporters of the Islamic Republic. And okay, the regime. so there is a, a coherent uh, point of view shared by the demonstrators, if, you're, if, if I'm hearing you right. In other words, they are not the same people who led the Green Revolution. These are not the Iranian middle class. Sorry, the, the Green Revolution was middle class. Right? More middle class, and this is sort of much uh, lower working class that have lost during the past decades of the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and the class distinctions in Iran have become sharper and sharper. Whereas again, the Islamic Republic is, since the revolution promised to create a more just economic kind of situation, it has actually created more economic injustice and, and, uh, and class differences in Iran. Well, so what? I mean, every country I can think of nowadays has done the same thing. I don't know what that means. But you have on one hand, in the case of Iran, one class that has become rich, extremely rich, and the Iranians, the majority, who, who cannot make it. In a sense, the, the poverty, extreme poverty, uh, has been really noticeable in the past, particularly past uh, few years. Well, I would assume that's the case. If people are rebelling over the price of gasoline, it must be that they're really feeling the pinch economically. Although, I don't know whether you could say that generally or not. I mean, after all, the yellow vest people in France are you know, wreaking havoc, and I don't know that they're really suffering. I mean, French, you know. Yeah, but it is it is question of the relative things. Firstly, the question in France is yes, the 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 working class. They feel like there there's more and more pressure on them. But of course, yes, they're not going to hungry and all this. But you see, like if you walk in south of France, like. 20 years ago, when I would go there, you hardly ever saw any homeless. Last year, when I was there, I was quite surprised. Mm -hmm. In a city like Montpellier, and all this, you see people, homeless people everywhere. I mean, we see the same thing in Canada, in Toronto, in Montreal. Over the years, I have seen how the number of homeless people have increased substantially, not just a little bit, but substantially. So, and so those are the situations. But in the context of Iran, when, when the, the, the rich get much richer, we don't have the welfare, welfare state the way that you, um, it is in Europe or even in US, even though they don't have the same kind of the welfare state. But in Iran, you only have your family network. If everyone 
is getting poorer and poorer. They cannot also support one another. And therefore, the situation there becomes much more crucial. On the other hand, the regime has been talking about uh, at least, if not social justice, economic justice, is uh, continuously talking about that they represent the, the oppressed and the, and the poor, and yet their policy has actually made the poor poorer and the rich richer, and the gap between the rich and poor is increasing while the, the, the kind of talk, the ideology that the regime presents is actually promoting that kind of a more egalitarian. So there's a contradiction between the regime's economic policy and what they are presenting as they stand for. So this An additional point is that the class in Iran that is getting richer and richer is because they are recipients of governmental subsidies, uh, free interest loans and loans that are excused, whereas the lower classes, working classes, do not enjoy the kind of support that the state gives to the, the, the industrial or, uh, or uh, the large companies in Iran that are proxies of the state. They are independent, but they are serving as a state proxies in international trade and industrial production. Well, it's always a mystery to me how there can be uh, increase in inequality. Uh, that is to say, how rich people can keep getting richer when the rest of the society is uh, under sanctions and, and unable to sell what they have internationally. And uh, how do businesses, who's flourishing there and how, how does anybody manage to flourish given the situation you've described? Well, there's a lot of corruption, but there's always, you know, never is the question of who can get things. There's smuggling, there's, there's uh, lots of other ways that the rich will get rich. But even under the sanction, there's a still regime still has some money. But the question is, how would they distribute that money? Bonus. So, so those kind of things, I mean, the corruption in Iran, in Iran, is one of the worst in the world. Well, really? 30 years ago, this didn't exist. In the, I mean, people always complain about the corruption at the top level, but what is happening in Iran is beyond imagination. Really? Oh. Yeah, it, it is in part also sanction induced economic sort of corruption uh, because only industrial and trade organizations that are closely allied with this state and are recipient of the state subsidies can survive. And thus companies, corporations receive funding from this state. But on the other hand, the workers lose their, uh, their subsidies for, oil, for gas, their subsidies for eggs and a whole lot of everyday commodities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me, if you will, about how um, the government of Iran is trying to influence things in other countries. Um, who's, uh, what's the name of that outfit, that, that military the outfit they maintain? Hezbollah. Yeah, Hezbollah, or... Hezbollah. That's what I'm thinking of, Hezbollah. Okay, now, so they've got Hezbollah someplace, and they've got something going on in Iraq. Uh, what um, I guess they they're they're trying, and I suppose other countries are trying to do things in Iran, tit for tat. I don't know. What what is the aspiration of Iran as far as dominance in the Middle East is concerned? What are they trying to accomplish? Whose side are they really on? And how much do you have to worry about their assuming too much uh, power in, in, in other countries in the Middle East? Come on. Well, Iran, uh, in some way, I've, I find Iran, just like any other country, would like to have um, influence in the region. Also, they are one of the largest, largest country in the region. But at the same time, they need that connection with other countries in order to protect 
the regime needs to protect itself because obviously um, the West has been against it from day one. Uh, I'm not just saying that without any um, good reason on the part of Iranian, but U.S. and the West have immediately that eight year old, eight years of Iran Iraq war was supported by the West, and and really that created a situation where he had influence in his, with Hezbollah, with, uh, with in Syria, with Iraq. Um, although Yemen, really, they didn't have much influence in Yemen. The Yemen situation was created by, by the West and Saudi Arabia to pull Iran there to another war. But Iran, I think, in some way, cleverly stayed out of it. <laughs> Largely, okay, they sent some guns and medical support and all of that, but they did stay out of it. The regime of Iran needed to have support of the countries around it because they needed to protect themselves against U.S. aggression, against Saudi Arabian ag aggression. So you can't deny that to a country. I mean, I have no, I'm not fond of the, this regime in any way, but then at the, at the, on the, any regime, any country has the right to defend itself. And I think the way the West received the Iranian regime from, from the beginning of the war, things didn't go accordingly either to what the West had planned or what the Iranian had planned. But Iran learned that they need to have influence in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in, in uh, Lebanon, and in Syria. And that is the way they protect themselves. If they didn't have these influences, who knows by now? Wouldn't Israel attack? Wouldn't U.S. attack? I mean, after all, U.S. has got all this gunship in the in the in the Gulf area. And and, now, if, you put this, and if you put this in a larger historical context, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen were prominent supporters of anti-Shah movement. These were the places where Iranian opposition often were welcomed in the pre-revolutionary period. And then in the post-revolutionary period, because of the US intervention and the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the rise of Saudi Arabia as a military political force, these countries where Iran had anti-Shah, anti-regime sort of sources have transformed formed into supporters of, of the, the, the Iranian government. In a sense, there is a prehistory to the current alliance between uh, um, Lebanon and Iran, Syria and Iran, and Iraq and Iran. Uh, as uh, Homa noted, um, the Iran had the, the long eight-year war with Iraq, but it's interesting that the U.S. government that went there to democratize Iraq did not manage to have the kind of influence that Iran has today. For a long time, Iran was kept out of Syria as the, the, the Arab Spring moved into uh, Syria. But again, Iran has much more influence in Syria than United States and uh, Saudi Arabia. Why? Why is Iran able to build these influences in the region is a question that has to be explored in the larger context of rivalries between Iran and Saudi Arabia, United States, Israel, and without that larger context, reducing it to only Iranian uh, interventionism does not really offer a satisfactory explanation. Mm -hmm. Iran under the Shah was influencing Afghanistan, was influencing what was going on to the Gulf. But at that time, they basically carried on, they were the, well, they called themselves the policemen of the Gulf, but they represented the United States in the, in the Middle East. Very much now, like Saudi Arabia does today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that's, um, I think the, the situation, you can't really understand the situation of Iranian politics without Firstly, putting it in historical context, it certainly is undemocratic. Certainly, this regime is extremely ideological and backward looking. But there are also this other side that we have to have in mind. 
Okay, suppose you two were uh, uh, elected to be president and, and supreme leader. You can pick which role you'd like to have. <laughs> Homer, you I want to be, be the president. <laughs> I'd like Homa to become the supreme leader of Iran, and that would be a true revolution. All right. Well, let's that just be you, you somehow came to power. Uh, what changes would you try to make? What kind of future would you like to uh, work toward? Uh, what kind of alliances, if any, would you join? Who would be your international friends, or whom would you try to cultivate? as international friends and um and so on the two of you are t now a team and please give me a, a, a convincing scenario for the future of iran <laughs> in 30 words or let's less. look for the supreme lady <laughs> <laughs> and whoever well, will I'll take you to dinner next time you're in town <laughs> i would uh, i Firstly, I think democracy is a demand for the public. But I also think we, I would go not for um, descriptive democracy, for a substantive democracy that represents with a, with a right for minorities. I think it's very important. Often when we talk of democracy, people think of majority, 50 plus one. That's not my vision of democracy. So, to me, substantive democracy definitely has has very much room for for views and protection of minorities. I would definitely question of gender for me is of course central to my my world vision. So gender equality and making sure that the legal system represents gender equality and represents um, international human rights there and every all of our laws but, but also ethics some of who i would cultivate i definitely would i would want to see the non-aligned movement um be galvanized again i would maybe have i would see my allies as like a scandinavian country in the west like sweden norway finland um so the scandinavian countries to me you present the kind of the best kind of society we have on earth presently. So, and also I think I think cultural context is important. Of course, I'm being an anthropologist. I think to respect um, cultures, but not to use that as a way of um, promoting discrimination in the name of culture. Everything you said would be a good. A goal for just about every country in the world. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think you're going to find that uh, Mohammed disagrees with very much. Are you on her team or not? Uh, well, I, I must say while uh, I will be you, uh, the Supreme uh, Lady uh, Homa Hutfar as a great revolutionary <laughs> development in Iran and in the region and worldwide actually, but I would be hesitant to join any kind of political parties. But uh, because I have a lot of academic work to do, but I offer some, um, some advice to my good colleague. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I must uh, say that uh, after 40 years uh, of the Islamic Republic, it is really time to loosen the grip on uh, ideological conformity. Iran has been historically a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, or multi-confessional state, and it is important to begin to accommodate non-Muslim, non-Shi'i uh, components of Iranian population, and in a sense to create some sort of popular state one has the, uh, under the leadership of our Supreme Lady, one, one has to really tap into people's differing agendas and different forms of identity. Mm -hmm. And thus, the Iran that I like to see promoted would be a multi-confessional and multi-ethnic Iran. Okay. But then, politically, I would not cave in to any kind of economic pressure by Donald Trump. I think 
The sanctions provide a great opportunity for what is historically referred to as import substitution. Iran can build a very strong uh, economy under without international competition, and thus I'm, I'm, I'm really baffled why Iran hasn't actually done that under these economic conditions, mm -hmm. that it has been the best way to go. And, you know, and while I, I think the connection with the West is uh, very important, orienting toward Asia uh, is much more important for Iran. Closer collaboration and friendship with his uh, neighbors, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Turkey, uh, Iraq, uh, per Persian Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, all of these are important. Of course, the hostility between Iran and Saudi Arabia has a lot to do with the competition that the Islamic Republic has as the leader of a revolutionary Islam and Saudi Arabia as custodian custodian of conservative Islam. And one way or another, one has to also overcome this, this regional ideological conflict that has turned Saudi Arabia into a more hardcore supporter of uh, Wahhabi Islam and distributing all over the world. And Iranian regime has also become the supporter of Shiism. I like to see a more more historically grounded multi-confessional Islam, uh, Iran, multi-confessional Islam, but economically vibrant and uh, more global in its outreach, it may be able to solve its economic problems, its political problems with the United States. But if Iran has the support of its own internal population, it does not, it doesn't really need to have uh, um, an economic relationship with the United States if it's run by Trump in the na next four years. Okay, we've, wa we've wandered into the topic of religion. Uh, and and it, while we're on it, uh, then let me ask, do you feel that, I mean, I've heard people say Islam just hasn't gone through a um, reformation movement, hasn't gone through a modernization movement, and that this conservatism, which is apparently true in both Sunni and Shia ends of the spectrum, um, that this is, uh, this is the problem that, that people have to, you, you need a Martin Luther or somebody. Um, uh, tell me, what uh, 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 do you think that some kind of change in the, in the, in the faith itself is, is required, or would you just pin all your hopes on this uh, multi-confessional kind of society and hope that balancing these various religions off against each other will tame them somehow. Omar. No, I, I actually think it's an absolutely secular state. People can be Muslim, Christian, Baha'is, whatever. A secular state in, um, doesn't actually um, bring in religion in, in, in that way. I mean, people, to me, a state has to be secular in order to be able to be democratic. So, um, and I don't, I don't believe that, um, Islam is any better or any worse than any other religion. If you look at the history of Christianity, all the atrocities they went through, the killing and all of these things, it's very similar. You know, there are as many Islams as there are Muslims. Because people understand their religion kind of differently. They may go through similar rituals, but each of those rituals being really different for them. When Needing an Islamic reformation uh, and, and uh, attributing uh, all the faults of the Muslim states, particularly Islamic Republic of Iran and Saudi Arabia on Islam, I, I, I think is misguided in a sense. Islam has been reformed and, and in the kind of research that I have done since from the 16th century onward, Every decade, every century, you see radical transformation of Islam. The Islam that is reigning in Iran today is not the same as the Islam of the pre-revolutionary period. And I make a distinction between micro-Islam, Islam that people live with, 
that is tolerant and it's accepting of differences, particularly religious differences. And, and I say that because of my own experience of living in the most conservative part of, of uh, historical Tehran, where Armenians, Baha'is, Jews, uh, and Christians of various denominations lived together, traded with, with one another in the bazaar, that micro-Islam is radically different from the macro-Islam that is used to protect and shield the, 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 the regimes that speak in the name of Islam. One version of it is, is the Islamic Republic in the a, in a name of true Shiism, and the other version of it is, Islamic, is uh, Saudi Arabia as, as the guardian of conser conservative Islam. All of these are engineered, fabricated Islam's ideological state Islam's. And the Islam that Muslims live in their everyday life, I think is very democratic, is very reformed. And in everyday conduct, most Muslims, with exception of these ideological Islam's, are tolerant of religious differences, tolerant of political differences, but in the very same way that that Bible Belt has been invented in the United States and has become part of the Republican Party sort of political mm -hmm. agenda, the same thing is happening also um, in Saudi Arabia in, uh, and in Iran. And one cannot blame Christianity for the Republican Party's actions and, and calculations mm -hmm. as one cannot blame uh, Islam for what the Islamic Republic of Iran does or Saudi Arabia does. Okay, so all right with me. Uh, Oma, what do you think? <laughs> well, yeah, I agree with what Mohammed said. It's, it's basically what uh, I was trying to say before. I, I think that's what I said. Um, I think the, the everyday, everyday life of Muslims and what they consider Islam is very different than the political Islam that the regime, whether it's Iranian or Saudi Arabia or, or Al-Azhar, sometimes, for instance, the Baha'i uh, people in Iran do suffer sometimes, in, uh, even in the past, in the hand of in their everyday contact, but it's never like being discriminated, not being allowed to go to places or of people not talking to them. So I Do you have um, any grounds for optimism uh, about the direction of uh, the culture, uh, perhaps the religion, although you don't seem to feel that's where you need to focus, uh, and, and, um, and of course the political uh, realities in Iran? It, uh, I know that, Homa, you've been a victim. You've been imprisoned for your work, especially with women and for democracy. But um, uh, do you have any grounds for hope? Everyday culture of people in Iran, I think, is much more sophisticated today. And so I am very optimistic <clears throat> uh, whether, whether the change of regime happens today or not. I do think that the culture has really changed in a very positive direction. And in any case, I'm ever optimistic. I always say we can't afford disillusionment. It's a luxury we cannot afford. Okay. Mohammed, you have the last word. Well, um, if we focus on the regime and the macro account of Iran, one may end up in a state of despair seeing that Islamic Republic is all powerful and uh, is imposing its will through sheer force on Iranians. My preference is to look at micro Iran, look at the sort of Iranians in their everyday life. And it appears to me in comparison with the neighboring state, the kind of Iran that is emerging through individual subjects and mode of thinking is much more tolerant, much more liberal, and much more cosmopolitan and internationalist. And I'm hoping that this individual initiatives that are pervasive through Iran 
these individual initiatives, one way or another, emerge as part of the future Iran rather than if, uh, an Iran that we identify with the regime. So my hope is in Iranian citizen, their citizens, their enlightenment, their cosmopolitanism, and their uh, cultural um, democracy. Thank you. Well, that's an uplifting solution for the way to end our little conversation, which has been very interesting. And I want to thank you both. Thank you very Be much. Back in touch. Bye. It has been an honor to be yeah. with you and Homa. Bye. This conversation is one of the weekly series, Talk About Saving the World, produced by Peace Magazine and Project Save the World. Please visit our website at tosavetheworld.ca, where you can sign the Platform for Survival, a list of 25 public policy proposals that, if enacted, would greatly reduce the risk of six global threats to humankind. Come back next week for another discussion of a serious global issue.